Adam Day, Victoria University of Wellington, will speak about amenable groups. Thanks, Norm. I guess I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organisers for inviting me here and also letting me speak. I've spent quite a few summer schools, I think four summer schools I've come to the IMS. I've spent a lot of time sitting in this auditorium and uh, following, or perhaps not entirely following, various lectures from, from eminent logicians, so it's, it's a privilege to be able to uh, speak to you all. I'd also like to sort of, you know, thank Rod and acknowledge Rod in his, uh, in his 60th year. How many, how many more days has he got, Rod? 20th of September. 20th of September, so we are, we are not quite celebrating the 61st year yet. And so I really want to thank Rod for all his support. So I, I was a student of Victoria, then I did my, my PhD under Rod's supervision, and, you know, he, he, uh, he taught me a lot. So earlier this year, Noam and I organised a... You know, another event in the, in the 2017 year of Rod and, uh, in Romati. And that was, a, you know, a sort of a well-attended conference. I think there's quite a few people here we were there. And I think most and all, I hope we had pretty good positive feedback about that. Except for one person. One person you know, raised, a, raised a, sort of a criticism, uh, which on reflection I was thinking, you know, I can, I'm grown, I can, I can take criticism and maybe I can try and, try and uh, remedy it. It was that, you know, a lot of the tones of the discussion and reminiscences about Rod were a little bit too reverent in tone. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's pointed out to me that, you know, if you think about a, a sort of Australian culture, and, and I, I guess uh, and we were looking from New Zealand, we look over to Australia, and so perhaps our, our viewpoint of Australia is a bit warped, but we sort of, you know, see it's a, it seems to be a very common tradition to, to send up and, uh, and make fun of those that you, you respect and, and admire. You know, I'm just thinking of great sort of Australian icons like, you know, Carly Minogue or, or Shane Warne or, or someone like that. <laughs> uh, so, and the problem of, with looking at Australian cultures is Australians also sort of, sort of mock and, and derise people that they dislike. And it can be a very kind of hard from, I guess you're not entirely au fait with, with this, about where the, where the line should be drawn between, you know, going too far. So... For the avoidance of any doubt, I just need to make that the, the following remarks are just meant with the purest and deepest respect for, for Rod. <laughs> so uh, one, one, I think maybe from Rod's work in uh, complexity theory, you know, he's, he's developed a, a very efficient style of working, and he, you know, he, he does things very quickly. Uh, so, but what is efficient for Rod is not necessarily always efficient for people working with him. I wonder how many of us have, have received an email from Rod and have spent, you know, 30 minutes trying to, trying to decrypt it or to, to look at some collection of letters and do some sort of nearest neighbour decoding to figure out what, what possible word it could be. I also remember a trip that Rod, you know, I thought I'd get a shortcut to a conference with Rod, uh, not realising that we were passing a surfing spot on the way that was a, a two-hour detour. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, was a, it was a very enjoyable part of a country that I'd never been, been before. Well, as a student with Rod, actually, we had um, we, were, we were doing some lecture, and so Rod turned up at the first lecture of the course lecture notes, and you know he must have been in a rush because he came in and and he photocopied them for us, but he, you know he, he must have gone flipped one side to two sided, so we ended up just having all the odd pages of the lecture notes, and so fine, easy, easy mistake to make in a photocopier. So in, in, the, in the following lecture, Rod remedied his mistake by bringing us all the even pages of the notes. <laughs> So there we had rest of, of course, we had these two piles of the even pages and the odd pages, and we were kind of reading from one side, flipping to the other, and, and going back and forth. Um, the other, actually, the very first memory I have of Rod was, was in a second year course in uh, algorithmic graph theory. So Rod was dis uh, describing some algorithm, and what I remember most is that he would stand on one side of the room, and he would jump up and say, you can pull something down here, and then he would dash across to the other side of the room, and he said, if that doesn't happen, you can pull this down here. But if this was going on, then you could... I have no idea what the theorem was being proved at the time, but all I just remember was this, this, this great sort of dynamic uh, illustration. <laughs> oh, this was, this was a good 10 years ago. <laughs> but you, but the fact, Rod, Rod I mean, may, you know, I, I don't think he's lost some of his dy dynamicism because... Uh, at part of the sort of Rodfest meeting uh, and subsequently I was talking to some students 
who have more recently done Math uh, 161, which is a first year course we have in com, uh, sort of, I guess, introductory uh, discrete mathematics course. And they tell me that Rod had been uh, very fond, he found an umbrella, and he had spent a lot of the time sort of gesticulating about the board with this umbrella. And the more they thought of it, the more they sort of really reminded them of a, of a popular figure uh, who was also, you know, you know, we were sort of floating about the room with an umbrella. <laughs> and and so, so much so that they, uh, they, you know, we have, in our courses, we have these alternate Facebook course homepages, which the students run, which aren't sort of, aren't privy to uh, sort of lecturing stuff. So that they, they, they photoshopped a, a, um, a, a copy of, of this, you know, a poster for this movie uh, with Rod in a prominent part. And I did manage to get a hold of this, so. <laughs> So yeah, so, so I think so Rod is still inspiring students to great creative endeavors to, today. So, so thank, thank, thank you for that, Rod. Um, all right, so now, now some, on to some maths. Oh, so, so this color scheme. <laughs> this, some of you will get the joke about this color scheme being inspired by um, <laughs> So, th so the setting that we're, we're going to be looking at for this talk is we're going to have a, A is going to be a countable alphabet, and G will be a countable computable group. And by computable, I just mean, you know, you can regard it as a, you, you know, it, the group operation can be regarded as being computable as a function from N cross N to, to N. And we're going to place a product top of, oh, so A to G will be the set of functions from the group to A, and we'll place a product topology on this. And the main idea is we want to look at is can we transfer some of the theory of algorithmic randomness from the, from the sort of more classical setting of 2 to the N, or, or A to the N, to, to this particular case. All right, so to start with, I'll give a, an uninteresting answer to the question. And that is, well, if you just ignore the group structure, then, then really you've just got the accountable product space. So you can take some isomorphism between G and, and N, and you can regard A to the G and A to the N as essentially the same thing, and you can sort of transfer all the theory of algorithmic randomness um, between, between the two, including things like you know, one randomness and, and, and such like. But of course, you know, why would you bother doing this? Why would you even bother um, putting in a group if you were actually not going to use any of the group structure? So I want to sort of talk about sort of where we might sort of see the, the group structure coming in. All right, so I want to, to talk about a group actions and think of them as being dynamical systems. So here's a typical example of a dynamical system. You, you have X as some set and you have some automorphism of X where this automorphism preserves whatever structure you're interested in. It could just be a continuous map if you're looking at a uh, topological space or a measure-preserving map. And we can think of this really as, as a, a Z acting on the space if, if uh, T is a bijection, and where the you know, A of NX goes to the, the nth iterate of, of this map. And in general, we can think of groups as performing a similar role where we take um, you know, uh, some action of, of the group moving, working on this, uh, uh, acting on some space. So to make things for concrete, and this is what I've mainly been looking at, it's just going to fix uh, the left shift action of G on the space A to a G. So G is a group, and so the, their action, so, so X is an element of A to G, so it's a mapping from G to the alphabet, and if I shift it by G, then, then in the, um, then the G of X of H is mapped to whatever X of G inverse H is, is mapped to. Okay, so, so, that, so that's, that's going to be the, sort of a, the kind of groupness which is going to um, apply to this, this particular talk. And I want to, you know, we, I want to look at sort of prefix for complexity. And we're really used to defining k of like x up to n, uh, where x is some element of 2 to the n. And I, I want to generalize this notion. So let's uh, take some, call something an approximation sequence to a group G. If 
uh, every element in our approximation sequence is a finite subset of G, and we have the property that each element of G is contained in all but finitely many uh, of the FI. So it's basically the FIs, I guess I should say the FIs also should be getting bigger, and so then they, you know, their union is going to be all of G. Uh, so for example, an approximation sequence to Z could just be given by FI as all of the numbers from negative I to I. Um, if you have a finitely generated group, you can basically look at the, the ball around the identity. So you can look at uh, the group elements which you, you can get by um, uh, you know, multiplying together a number of, of generators or its inverses. And then we can think, if we have some element of A to a G, we can think of the initial segments, as you like, of this as being functions of the form uh, X restricted to F0, X restricted to F1, and so on and so forth. Um, so you can require it to be monotonic, and you can, well, yes, let, let, let's, let's make it monotonic for this, this talk, even, even though I haven't, just haven't set that up here. Okay, so then we need to think about, well, what is the, what is the prefix-free complexity of these initial segments? Well, the easy, I mean, the easiest way to think about it, I, I think, is that what all this is, is a, is a map, is a finite subset of the group cross um, the alphabet. And these are both accountable in a finite set. So you, it, it's, we can just fix some isomorphism of G cross A with, with the natural numbers. And we can talk about a finite, the complexity of a finite subset the same way we'll talk about it, the complexity of any, any sort of normal finite subset. Uh, and so it's a very sort of natural way of defining, defining this. Now, the, the, the reason I want to be a little specific is I want to know that if I have a description of some sigma, where sigma is, a, is an element of, of Fn to A, then from that description I can recover Fn, and I can also recover the values that uh, sigma takes on the elements of Fn. So then the interesting thing we're looking at is um, dimension. So I want to use initial segment complexity to look at analogs of effective Hausdorff dimension <coughs> and effective packing dimension. Um, uh, um, and I've never really been sure what the correct sort of notation is before. I, and I don't want to be saying effective a Hausdorff dimension effect a packing dimension over time. So I'll just use L dim to denote the Lemynth and U dim to denote the, the Lim soup of these two things. And you probably first think that, you know, this definition that we're getting is going to be dependent upon the approximation sequence which you pick. And in, in general that's true, but if we, we look a bit further ahead, we'll see that some, at some point some of this independence will, will become, uh, dependence will become less important. So now we've got some X. And say we know everything we want to know about X restricted to Fn. And I want to ask myself, what if I happens if I, if I apply my group action to X and I look at uh, G of X restricted to Xn? What do I know about these two things? Well, this is a little equation up there which says that if, um, if G inverse H is in Fn, then we know um, G dot X of, of H. Right, this is just because of the way the, the left uh, uh, shift action has been defined. So in fact, we know lots of things, you know, basically there's, there's an overlap of, we can go to being like an overlap of, of two balls. So what, what do we, I'm trying to see here. So if I want to look at the complexity of this whole ball around g dot x up to fn, then I already know some stuff from here, and if I'm given g, all I need to know is what values gx takes upon the elements of the group inside fn and not inside gfn. And if, if my, and then I can encode that by using the logarithm of the size of the, the alphabet. So I just can just include all the other bits here. And so if I want to look at, say, the, the lower dimension, or the effective uh, Hausdorff dimension, then if I take the, these limits, then this term, which is constant, is going to disappear. This term's going to stay here. 
uh, and we're going to get this additional term here as well. So if we have the situation that this term tends to zero, right, then we'll get this as less than this, and so the, the, the L dim of g to x is going to be less than or equal to the, the lower dimension of, of x. So you can ask yourself, what sort of groups can we get in an approximation sequence that has this property, that fn set minus g of fn uh, has a, has, has, um, has, tends to zero? Right, and there's a, a very well-known answer. So a, we call an approximation sequence to G a Follner sequence if for all elements of the group, if I look at the, this limit here, it tends to zero. So this isn't quite exactly what I had before. Here I had um, you know, Fn set, set minus Gn, Gfn. But you know, if this equals zero, then the other thing's going to equal zero. And so what th this means is that if we can define dimension using Follner sequences along a group, then for all G and all X and G, we'll have this, uh, both the packing, dimen packing dimension and the effective Hausdorff dimension are going to be invariant under the action of, of the group. So that, that's, a, that's a very, in, you know, this is kind of a very obvious thing to sort of, to see, and the first thing you, you know, when you, well, first thing I saw anyway when I, I was looking at it. Uh, and then you ask yourself what groups of Follner sequences, and then the theorem of Follner is that a, a countable uh, group G has a Follner sequence if and only if it's amenable. So of course these, these Follner sequences didn't come out of, you know, uh, are something once you look at sort of you know, trying to preserve uh, dim the dimension of a point under, under the action of, of G, but you know, they've been a study for, for much longer. And just to kind of go over what is an amenable group, well, a group G is amenable if there is a finitely additive, so we change sigma additivity to, to finite additivity, and we have a measure, and it's defined on the full power set of the group, and it's a, it's a probability measure, and it's also invariant under, under the action of, of the group. So you, you can't get um, a full measure because you can just apply the normal uh, Vitali construction of a non-measurable set to uh, most cases to, to, um, to, to prevent this from happening. Uh, right. um, maybe it's just while well, well, we're on the subject of amenable groups, let's have a, another look at something else. So a group is paradoxical if you can break it into these disjoint subsets, A1 to AM, and B1, I mean, it probably should be different sizes, A1 to AIN, say, and B1 to BM, uh, and there's also got some group elements such that I can kind of rebuild the entire group just by taking these pieces uh, and, sh and moving them by, by group elements. Uh, the theorem of Tarski is that a group is paradoxical if and only if it's not amenable. And you m might know that sort of, you know, paradoxical groups are tied to the banach tarski paradox. And I'll just you know, give you a trick diagram to show that uh, the, f the free group on two generators is, is um, paradoxical. So if I draw the, the Cayley graph of the, uh, of the free group, All right, and I can break it into the following pieces. So I can have, this could be piece uh, A1, this can be piece A2, this one here can be piece, so it's going to go right along this central axis, piece B1, and then all the stuff around here, this can be B2, and all the stuff over here can also be B2. So I can bring the whole group back from these two pieces just by shifting A2 up to uh, up one, and if I remove A1 and A2, and I shift all the B2 along one, you know, I've recovered the group again. So that, that's, that's an example of a group which is, is paradoxical. And so paradoxical groups are precisely the non-amenable groups.
Okay, um, so there's lots of amenable groups. All abelian groups are amenable. Uh, all finitely generated groups of uh, polynomial growth are amenable. Subgroups of amenable group are amenable. Uh, if you have a normal subgroup of, if n is a normal subgroup and n and g mod n are amenable and so is g. Uh, some of these proofs require the axiom of choice and sometimes the transition between the different notions of amenability also requires choice. So that's a little bit of background on groups and, and I should say why maybe I'm interested in this question. Well, there was some work done by Steve Simpson when he looked at uh, you know, the relationship between various different types of, of entropy, showing that particularly that uh, topological entropy uh, was the same thing as Hausdorff dimension for various cases of various groups act, acting on, um, on the space A to the G. Uh, and also he asked the open question in his paper, can this all this work be extended from the groups he considered to all amenable groups? So before looking at the answer to that question, let's uh, just have a look at what a, a, a topological entropy. So we've got a closed subset of A to the G, so this is topologically closed, and it's also closed under the left shift action. So if you have G and uh, in G and X in there, you, and then, you, then G of X is inside here. So these mappings are all continuous, so we can consider this as a topological dynamical system. And then we have this definition of topological entropy. So it's the, it's, I'll draw, draw a picture because it'll be much easier. So say, just ignoring the group case, just considering the case two to the N. So for example, you can have a, Say you have a tree, and this tree has, this, which I'm trying to draw, will have no two um, right paths. So you never, you never can go, you can't go right twice. Uh, so you go right, then you have to go left, then you go right, and you have to go left. And you can count, um, and you just can think of this as actually, uh, so you think of all the paths, you can think of this as like a, generating a closed subset of all the paths through here. And then this thing is just saying, let's just count the, the number of um, nodes which are extendable at each level and take the logarithm of that and then just divide it by um, the, the total number of nodes that you could have. Okay, so... One, one thing that you get immediately is if, if this sort of tree is computable, then you get that um, the, the upper dimension, or the packing dimension of any point, is going to be less than the topological entropy. And the reason is there's not very many, you've got this bound on the number of um, points at each level, and you just translate that bound directly into you know, um, you know, a, a prefix free code, and the, the translation just goes like this. So the complexity of x up to f of n is going to be less than or equal to the position plus the number of um, nodes at that point. And if you take the limits, uh, then you'll get this will disappear, and so you'll get this as being less than the topological entropy. So there's nothing, nothing major there. So the interesting work is on the other side of the coin. And this when you're wanting to look about the effective um, dimension. So you can ask yourself with this tree, for example, well, is it possible that there's something inside here whose um, <coughs> effective Hausdorff dimension is going to be the same, is going to be sort of obtaining sort of the maximum results? So you've got this bound on, on, the, um, on, on the packing dimension, but can you sort of show that th that sort of bound as a maximum is obtained by something uh, using the, its effective Hausdorff dimension? And the, the answer is that, well, here's one way of saying that. Basically, yes. You can prove that if the lower dimension of, of everything inside here is small, then the topological entropy must be small, which implies that the, the upper dimension is also small. Yes and yes. So what does this tell us? It tells us, well, if you just ignore this, this infant bit, then it tells you that the, the topological entropy is going to be less than or equal to the, the soup of the um, dim, 
of, a, of, a dimension, of the effective Hausdorff dimension of all the elements inside the set. And so if you can then generalize this to take it over, you, you know, relativize all these proofs, and you can then do this over all oracles. And so then you can sort of characterize this entropy in, in terms of uh, this value. And then, but I, I, I'm not going to show you how to translate sort of Hausdorff dimension to the space, but you, you basically just do it in a very sort of root, you know, routine way. And so you get that the Hausdorff dimension of this, this set X is the same uh, as the topological entropy, because this is by work of, of error and others. We have this characterization of um, Hausdorff dimension. So here's, here's a case. So the case, I know N's not a group, but you know, I'll just bear with me for this. So the case in G in, in the setting of N uh, is due to Furstenberg, uh, and then Simpson extended this result to uh, N to the D or, or Z to the D, and then uh, well, question whether it could be extended to uh, any amenable group, and I think the answer is yes, you can uh, kind of you know, jazz these proofs up to, to make it work for, for any amenable group. Okay, so what's going on in, in the proof? I, I don't really want to talk about the details very much, but it, it, it basically uses uh, a, a, an amazing lemma of Ornstein and Weiss, which, which, was, which was used to give an alternative proof of uh, a, you know, a theorem which we'll look at later. So, what, 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 is this, what is the problem which is going on? See. So, assume we're in this situation and we know that around every point that's below the dimension is small. And then we've got some particular point, um, some, we've got some x in A to the G, and we've got some Fm where M is going to be large. And we've got some map, and so here is a picture of F, Fm, and so we've got some mapping, which x is a mapping from here, uh, goes to some alphabet A. Now I want to be able to give a, a short description of this particular mapping. So what I would like to be able to do is I would like to be able to break this up into lots of pieces. So in here we've got group elements. I'd like to take little kind of pieces of this which are disjoint. And all of these pieces have a, have a short description. And so I'd like my pieces to be disjoint and almost cover the whole space. And so I can just add the extra descriptions that I need as, as, a, as a string. And so Ornstein and Weiss had, had been working on, on proving uh, the shadow mcmillan and Breiman theorem for amenable groups. And so they, they used this technique, and they were able to sort of prove the shadow mcmillan and Breiman theorem for a subclass of amenable groups uh, using, the sort of, you know, using these sort of distinct balls. But, what, but they couldn't get the, the full proof to work. And then, then recently, after some work of Lyndon Strauss, they were able to adapt their techniques, and they were able to change these balls so they overlap slightly. So you have these balls which are slightly overlap, and, but are, are basically disjoint. And the, the difficulty of the proof is that oh, the reason these balls exist is if I, if I look at, at around a, so I have G1, I can look at the point um, G1 inverse dot x. And I know that because the limb um, int, I know the L, because the L dim of this is less than s. I can find some approximation sequence around it, which has low complexity, and so I, I make that this. The, 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 the proof is kind of like a, um, an inductive argument, and you start by picking some balls, and you end up only covering epsilon of your space, but then you repeat this process you know, a, a large number of times, and eventually you, get, you end up covering um, almost all of it. So essentially, 
the main work I had to do was, was kind of pull out this combinatorial lemma, which is kind of spread across two different papers, and sort of repackage it and then sort of see that you know, it can be applied to the setting. Um, So that's topological entropy, but let, let's have a look at uh, adding a measure. So, so, so far this is an algorithm randomness, we haven't talked about anything about any measures, so we've got no real, real, real randomness as such, but we can remedy that now. Uh, there, there's two kind of really interesting theorems in measure preserving dynamical systems, which are interested in the, the Birkhoff ergodic theorem and the Shannon McMillan Breimer theorem. Um, so this is just last thing is just saying that, you know. One, I'm going to talk about one randomness at some times, but it's really just the obvious translation between, between the two spaces. Uh, okay, so this is really just a simple generalization of the, the notion of a, a measure of observing system. So instead of just having Z acting on a space, you've got a group acting on a space. And so what you want to do is if you fix some element of the group and you look at the mapping X maps to uh, you know, the action AG of X, it's measurable. And for each of these things, it, it preserves, um, preserves the measure. And then you have a similar definition of ergodic, basically saying that the, the invariant sets just have measure 0 or 1. And this time you're saying your set is invariant if that under every possible, thing, possible way of shifting it doesn't, doesn't change it. So what, what does Birkhoff's ergodic theorem look like in, in this case? Well, here's a, here's a simplified version of it. Um, I take a measurable set E, and I look, ask myself, if I take a uh, point X, and I look if I, if I apply this action of G onto X, and I say, do I get inside some set E? And I, basically, I count the number of times that I can move X into the set E, and just then just divide that by the size of the, of the balls. Right, so if you have an analog of Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, you would expect that you would have the property that this limit would equal um, the, the measure of x. So the, the, the number of times you hit e is, is equivalent to um, the measure of e. Okay, and so, so here's a, a summary of, um, what's of the results. So this was open for some time, and it was approved in 1999 by Lyndon Strauss. Birkhoff's ergodic theorem holds if g is an amenable group. And there's just there's this extra condition on the Follner sequences that you, you need to use. Does anyone know um, Moryakov? So he, he was a PhD student in uh, Ghent. He put a paper on the archive earlier this year. Um, who, who was seems to be a background analysis. Had generalized the... Um, well, there was a result which was proved by a bunch of people about Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. He had generalized that to the case of a minimal group action. So it's, it's, uh, his thesis is online, if you're interested. It's worth having a look at. Um, but yeah, I'm surprised that he hasn't seemed to have any interaction with the algorithm randomness community. Um, okay. So Lynn also generalized not just the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, but the Shannon McMillan Bryman theorem to minimal groups. And I, that's the next thing I want to look at this uh, Shannon McMillan Bryman theorem. Okay, so I just want to recap some definitions of entropy because Shannon McMillan and Brian theorem only, only makes sense in, with, with these things. So we're, we're going to start with a discrete probability measure on a countable set and look at the Shannon entropy of P is defined to be the sum minus the probability of CI times log the probability of CI. And I always think of this as if you can make a perfect prefix-free code for this particular problem, what would be the expected length? So the, the perfect prefix-free code, you, you choose codes of length log this, and the probability of negative log of PCI, and, the, and PCI is a probability that something's going to occur, so the expected length is, is this. All right. So now we've got this idea of uh, the Shannon entropy in, in the background. Let's consider something new, which is Kolmogorov sinai entropy. Uh, and I'll actually, I'll, I'll do a slide out of order. I'll look at this, this, defin this definition here. So this is saying, well, I will look. So, so it's sort of an analogous to this, you know. So, so imagine that, you know, 
When we define topological entropy, we were looking at each level at the number of, of points which are defined. Well, imagine that now that you've, you're just looking, you've got a full tree, and you're really looking at what the measure says uh, of the, ex, you know, so what's the measure of the extensions of this point? What's the measure of the extensions of this point? What's the measure of the extensions of this point? And so on. So this gives you a finite probability measure on a finite space, and so you can just take the uh, Shannon entropy of that. And so this line is just saying um, HN is going to be sort of the, the, the sort of Shannon entropy of here. And as you go up, you're expecting this to, the entropy to increase because you've got lots more choices, there's lots of, there's, um, you know, there's less known. But the idea is that if you divide this by N and then you take its limit, then this limit does exist and that gives you the comma gross and entropy. So what's the relationship between the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy and prefix-free complexity packing dimension and effective Hausdorff dimension? Well, because the system is ergodic, and, that, and, and the effective Hausdorff dimension assigns a, a value to every point, and the effective packing dimension assigns a value to every point, and as we saw earlier, that the, these values which are assigned are uh, invariant under, under the orbit, then the set of points that have a particular packing dimension or a particular effective Hausdorff dimension is a, an invariant set. Right? And, and this means that there is a, a particular single value, because it's ergodic, which is taken by almost all points. So um, there, is a, there is a point, a number HL, such if almost all X for lower dimension or effective Hausdorff dimension of X is HL, and there's another HU such that the effective uh, packing dimension is HU. <coughs> Now, if you think about this for a while, this kind of equ equation will eventually seem obvious. I'm not saying it does it does right now. Basically, that if you look at this value, this means that almost every kind of string of a certain length has a has a description of at most this you know, this times its length. And so that means that the, the way we've defined the Shannon, this, this uh, entropy using Shannon entropy, and the Shannon entropy is a, a optimal prefix-free code, then it's, you, can't, you, know, you, must, you, you can't do any worse than if you just take the, instead of using, um, to get the Shannon, this kind of Shannon entropy, you can just take the actual prefix-free codes for every string of a certain length. And that is going to give you a prefix-free code, which is going to be has to be whose entropy has to be bigger than expected value has to be bigger than the, the Shannon entropy. Uh, and this one as well, you can you can just think of, of well, if um, if you could do better on lots of things, then you could also pull down the, the entropy. Yeah, minus and where? Oh yeah, it should be a minus here. Thank you. Yep. All right. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to give two statements of the shannon william Breimer theorem. So this is, this is a more simplified classical statement. So if you have a ergodic measure-preserving uh, measure for the left shift action, and you let H be the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy, and then you have a, a suitable Fulner sequence, then for almost all X, you get this, um, this, this this limit here. So this is like, this is like the measure of, of the, the set of sequences which extend uh, this uh, finite <coughs> function. All right. <coughs> but the thing is that if X is one random, then the lower dimension of X is, e is equal to the limit of, of this value, and the upper dimension... Oh, what am I done? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I thought... Right. So, that, so then I can, I can change... So, But here's, here's how I think of X. I think this is... If you take a computable group and you take a computable ergodic measure for the left shift action um, and you define dimension using a tempered Fulner sequence, then for almost all x, the effective Hausdorff dimension equals the effective packing dimension. Right? And the reason you can switch from thinking of lower dimension and upper dimension uh, from this, this thing, which is less, I think, less intelligible to me, is because that if something is one random, then the lower dimension is equal to the limit for this, and the upper dimension is equal to the, this. So this is this is and so of course if you sandwich, um, if the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy is sandwiched in between there, then this must mean that this, this common value of these shear is the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy. Uh, okay. 
So what's the effective version? And the effective version is you just take this thing and you replace for almost all x with if x is uh, one random. <coughs> so I so said the case where g is n was proved by Vuegen, um, or who did the who did the L, who did sort of half of it, and, and Horup, who finished it off in 2013. And new proof is actually quite a bit simpler and extends to all to all amenable groups. So the, the last thing I want to talk about just briefly is why do, why do other people care about um, entropy? And it, it sort of came as developed as a, a way to classify whether different dynamical systems are isomorphic or not. So if I take uh, A to be an alphabet of size n, and I, let, I, I think of, I can just put a uniform measure uh, on A, and then I can take a product of all those uniform measures, then I get a, a, a what's called a full shift over over G, and the original question, which I think is due to von Neumann, was: Is it true that the that the two shift uh, over Z is isomorphic to the three shift over Z? And this was answered by Kolmogorov. And Kolmogorov's Sinai entropy came a little bit later but it was kind of derived out of that process of, of trying to understand this problem, that these things are not isomorphic. In fact, it's a, this it gives you a stronger result that you can't, I mean, like a factor map between dynamical systems is sort of like a, you know, like a homomorphism, and you, you can't have a factor map from the full two shift over Z to the full three shift. And the, the reason being is it's kind of, it's, you can think it from a computability perspective, if you have an x in 2 to the z, and you have sort of y in 3 to the z, and you take a random point, then you know, the, the, the dimension of this is going to be 1, and the dimension of this is going to be whatever it is, bigger than 1 anyway. Um, and th this, and you can sort of basically show that factor maps can't, uh, must be, not, uh, instead of decreasing, I should say non-increasing in, non in entropy. You can't kind of take a, point and then generate uh, more randomness out of it. And you can, you can prove this in a very sort of computability theoretic uh, way. So Ornstein and Weiss went further than that and they basically showed that, um, you, you know, so these are examples of Bernoulli sh shifts, uh, but, but in general for a Bernoulli shift you can put different weights on the elements of A. And they showed that this common graph center entropy classifies as Bernoulli shifts up to, up to isomorphism. Okay, so where, where to kind of next? Well, a minimal group seems to be the, like the natural limit where a lot of things, a lot of things work nicely. A lot, a lot of things work, you know, you can kind of generalize Z using particular other techniques like the Ornst and Weiss lemma to amenable groups. But as soon as you try and go beyond that, you get into um, uh, major problems. One of the interesting things is that kind of this you know, factor maps must be decreasing entropy. This doesn't kind of work if you change your groups to a non-amenable group like the free group. One of the reasons that factor maps must be decreasing entropy is, is that you can think of it as, if you just think of a group of, of like polynomial growth, as the ball, if you're trying to make, make some sort of mapping, a continuous mapping from one side to the other, as the balls grow, they only grow sort of comparatively smallly. So if you're trying to kind of put all the information content in which, you know, if you're trying to have put, like say, two bits of information content at each point from one bit of information content, then you don't have enough space to sort of find more information to pack into, into, the, into the image. But the thing about the free group is that it just grows so fast so that there's always information at the boundary that you can pull out and, and sort of plug into these uh, uh, factor maps. And so it's just, not, it's just not true that, you know, you have the two shift, for example, does factor onto the four shift um, and for, um, you know, for the free group. But, but nevertheless, the two shift and the, you know, uh, so, so Lewis Bowen proved that uh, developed a notion of entropy for free groups, and he showed that that, it, um, that the Kolmogorov's and entropy is an isomorphism invariant in this case. Uh, and he's also extended this to uh, Sophic groups, which possibly are all countable, I mean, countable groups, but un unknown. 
So, so what I'm interested in next is trying to understand how this notion of entropy works, because my, my feeling with, is that all these notions of entropy, I mean, like, look, look Hausdorff dimension, topological entropy, Kolmogorov Sinai entropy, they, they can all be understood in terms of what is the kind of the Kolmogorov complexity of the underlying points. And is it a, so are you defining these things for being a maximum, or are you averaging them, or are you taking, you know, so what, what are you doing with them? So I, my, my, my hope is that you can analyze some of these new entropies as well and try and sort of un, understand them from an algorithmic randomness perspective. And what's interesting is because there's, there's, at this point there's actually more open questions, right? There is, there is no known statement, the definition of, of uh, entropy for all groups that can classify, you know, they, can, they can determine whether things are, you know, they, they can show that. They so what you would like is a notion of entropy that you can give to, it applies to any group, and that two Bernoulli shifts over that group are isomorphic if and only if they have the same entropy. Well, at least one direction, that, that they have to be isomorphic, they have to have the same entropy. But nobody's come up with a, with a full notion of that yet. So this is, this, this is the point where I think it's quite interesting because looking at the previous kind of work in this area, it's really very closely tied to algorithmic randomness. Um, why shouldn't some of, the, some of the new questions now be, uh, you know, maybe our techniques and algorithmic randomness can help with those. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's all I've got, thank you. Um, okay, so, so all the, all the, sort of the more classical theorems, they can be extended to work for any sort of amenable groups, including sort of uh, uncountable. So can you extend your dog? So you mean computer, you mean uncountable groups which are, which are Polish? I haven't looked, I haven't, so one of the things is that the Fulner sequences, uh, I've only looked at being defined for, uh, for countable groups. There's, there's a way to generalize those, which, which I haven't looked at, to other groups. So, no, it's a good question. I mean, it, it's quite possible that you, you could do something with that. Question? Have you talked to Morning Alpha? No, no. I've been, I only, only became aware of it re relatively recently. Um, nobody ever died. But it's a nice, looks like a nice result. Okay.